There is the deadly violence in Afghanistan. And then there is a war here at home, the war against COVID-19. That fight is raging right now in hospitals all across the country. And for the first time since January, 100,000 people are in the hospital with COVID. 100,000. Think about how many people that is. That is a lot of people. That's more than many football stadiums. And in this war, the people on the front lines are the doctors and nurses. But we're only able to see a small amount of what they go through every day. Their fight is happening mostly behind hospital walls. But our NBC affiliate in Portland, Oregon, got a look inside the ICU of the state's top hospital. Every single patient on this unit right now has a breathing tube. It's a scene people outside of the medical field don't often see. But it's happening in hospitals all over Oregon, says ICU nurse Julie Cleese. Our physicians are just being called at every opportunity. Can you take this patient? Can you help us consult on this patient? This patient is 26 and dying. This patient is 21 and dying. This patient is a father of four and dying. Nurses are taking on extra shifts and working themselves into the ground, all to help their patients, almost all of whom chose not to get the vaccine. While we were there, only one patient out of 14 had been vaccinated. I don't think people have an inkling of the amount of suffering that you will experience being sick with COVID. Because it's too risky to have family members visit COVID-19 patients in their time of death, they're often alone, save for a nurse at their bedside who becomes their family in that moment. It's a near impossible and heart-wrenching task. What can you say? I know the depth of grief that I would feel if I couldn't be with my loved one as they died. So I take the responsibility very seriously to love that person as if they were my own family member um, and provide them with a death that's dignified and honorable as much as possible in an ICU that is sterile and cold and, and forgiving. And the frustration around people who refuse to get the vaccine keeps growing. You know, I had to call over to the pediatric ICU one day and ask for a beanie baby to give to a 12 year old while I turned off the support and her dad died. Like, I don't want to do that. ICU nurse Emily Williams has seen a lot. She's cared for people after a mass shooting, but she says this is another level with people staying in the ICU for weeks or months. If this continues, other people who need medical help won't be getting it. It kind of feels like the world just gaslighting you like they don't believe your experience. Gut-wrenching images and reporting out of Portland, Oregon. Joining us now is Dr. Nahid Fidelia. She's an infectious disease physician and the medical director of the Special Pathogens Unit at Boston Medical Center. And doctor, I'd like to start by asking your reaction to those nurses in that video, including the one who says they feel, quote, gaslighted. Yeah, I think from the very beginning, you know, we don't, we can't share images unless they, there's permission from the patients for the privacy of the patients. From, but from the very beginning, I think that if you could see just the impact this has on healthcare workers, but beyond that patients, and I, w- I want to point out a couple of things that may not be obvious when you're looking at these pictures. When you talk about states that have, you know, 90% ICU beds uh, completely occupied, and you talk about states that have to call other states in you know, hospitals to transfer patients, all of those things are having an impact on the mortality of the patients who are getting sick. So mortality of disease, if you get an infection when there aren't that many other people around, you know that's gonna be better because a lot of people can pay attention to you. There's no delay. When you get to a point where a lot of these states are at and you're seeing the situations, the outcome for many patients is worse. And so that's one part. The other part that they mention in this is the, the packet that it is, is so you know important to notice is that it's already affecting other people's health care. It's not just people who are COVID because if you mm-hmm. have ICU levels that are filled to that level, you have to delay elective surgeries, which by the way, elective surgeries is you're living in pain. Elective surgeries, your hip needs to be replaced, right? Those aren't really elective. They're affecting your mm-hmm. life. And the reason why 
we delay them is that a small portion of this may end up needing an ICU bed or a hospital bed, and you can't t- take somebody to the emergency, to the operating room, not knowing if there will be a bed for them in the hospital. So everybody's health is being affected, let alone you know, starting to talk about the impact it has on healthcare workers. And by the way, Zerlina, just to end with this, last winter, you know, I was hearing in my area hospitals about shortages of medications, and I never thought we'd be back there. I'm hearing that again, you know, hospitals across the country are experiencing shortages because they're being used with the high level of hospitalizations that you're seeing in states where vaccinations are low. It's so incredibly hard to hear because you know, an ICU is just, it's a hard place to be anyway, on a regular day when it's not full, when it, when it doesn't have, uh, you know, max capacity of, of people with COVID-19, because there are, there's so many additional protocols. You can't have family members in there um, the way that you normally would to, to be with their family members, to stay there around the clock like you normally would in an ICU. Additionally, the nurses are Uh, seeing and they have to deal with the family members. They're front facing with family members who are hearing terrible news and people are passing away. And ICU is like, you need therapy after you go through an ICU experience. And so certainly hearing from these nurses, it hurts my heart. Lay out for us what it means for other people. You mentioned elective surgeries and other types of treatment that require surgery and ICUs, perhaps, um, those people are affected. It's called collateral deaths. Explain to us what that means. Yeah, I think you can look at this at every level, right? So let's just start with a visiting policy that you were talking about. That doesn't just apply to people who are COVID. If your hospital is heavily affected, hospitals change visitor policy. And if you've had a loved one throughout this entire you know, pandemic in the hospital, which I did you know, during this period of time, you can't visit them even if neither one of you is there because of COVID, mm-hmm. because it changes the safety measures for everybody. So there might be other people who also, during one of some of the most dire moments in their life, who cannot have loved ones because the hospital has to keep safety measures in place. You then have, you know, what we talked about, lack of beds, right? The, if you have a ton of, you know, patients in the community, clinics may have to close down because they're, you know, concerned about transmission. So hours may be changed or there might be remote medic- you know, medicine rather than having seen people or delaying, you know, appointments because there's concern of transmission. So that that's outpatient impact. And then there's the inpatient impact. Like if you need to be admitted, let's say you have a, you know, accident, a motor vehicle accident during this period of time and your local hospital has no beds. You know, that impacts your health. It, all of those other things. You have, you know, heart failure exacerbation. You have asthma attacks. All of that care is impacted when the hospitals we're all ending up at, in the end, are overwhelmed with one disease because of the impact of low vaccination. And then that's not even to start to say the mental health impact. If you have healthcare workers who, mm-hmm. as we have in this country and around the world, you know, 20 months, 18 months here in this country, of just living in crisis, you know, taking care of patients, having to run and, and, and you know, see these emergencies and be mentally impacted by the loss of our patients. You don't think that has an impact on the people who are taking care of your loved ones and of you over time. And that's going to continue. You know, that impact is going to last for years. And the, the only thing people are asking oh, yeah. throughout this entire thing is believe that this is real. Get vaccinated. It's a preventable right. disease. It's a vaccine preventable disease at this point. So one of the things I've been thinking about all week long is the fact that last summer, you know, we were talking about hospitals being at capacity. We were talking about um, super spreader events and, and surges. But last summer, we didn't have a vaccine. We did not have a solution. This summer, we have that. So everyone in the hospital right now, um, you know, Basically, everyone, 99% are people who are not taking the available vaccine that's free and available to them to prevent this situation. How, what impact does that have on doctors and nurses? I mean, does that, I'd be pretty frustrated t- treating somebody, um, understanding that they had a choice not to be there. 
Yeah, there is a change, right? Because it, it, when we were seeing this in the winter uh, last year with the hospitalizations being high, there was a, it, was, it was high everywhere because we didn't have these vaccines. And when you look at you know, states like Massachusetts or elsewhere where the vaccination rates are high, the cases are going up. But there is what we call decoupling between hospitalizations, uh, deaths and infections, right? You people who are, there was a CDC report uh, this week that said, you know, LA County, uh, Los Angeles had 29 times lower rates. If you're vaccinated, 29 times lower chances of getting hospitalized. I'd take that odds, you know, like it's, it's, we have a new challenge, right? In the middle of all this stuff, we have a new challenge. Not only uh, we have the benefit of the vaccine, but we have a new challenge that if you're not vaccinated, we have Delta variant, which is a lot more transmissible. So it's actually even more Mm -hmm. dangerous for you to be not vaccinated this summer than it was last summer. Um, So it is, it is frustrating, but it's also just heartbreaking. You know, the patient in front of you is the patient in front of you and, and their care is your responsibility. It's so hard, though, um, you know, and, and God bless all the nurses and doctors like yourself who are, who are doing this hard work every day. Dr. Nahid Bedelia, thank you so much, um, as always, for being here. And please stay safe. 